Grand Canyon University's RN to BSN online degree program makes earning your bachelor's in nursing possible. Balance online coursework with local in-person clinicals to position yourself for potential leadership opportunities in the time you have from wherever you are, leaving room for what matters. Achieve your goals with your personalized plan and team behind you. Find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu. This week's podcast is brought to you by The Great Courses. I love learning. Uh, I got a couple degrees. I still read books and watch videos all the time. And that's why I'm a big fan of The Great Courses. These are video and audio lecture series taught by top professors and experts. And they just sent me the lecture series, The Art of Storytelling, from parents to professionals. And I think it's great. Professor and professional storyteller Hannah Harvey provides a great overview of how and why to tell live stories. I really like how she gets into both the theory and practical bits of how to build a character arc, which is exactly the kind of thing we look for here. In fact, if you wanted to do the kind of storytelling we do at the Story Collider, this course would be a great introduction. To check out this lecture and others, we have a special offer. Order from eight of their best-selling courses, including The Art of Storytelling, at up to 80% off the original price for a limited time. So order today. Go to thegreatcourses.com slash stories. That's thegreatcourses.com slash stories. One more time, thegreatcourses.com slash stories. A science story, huh? And I just thought, well, I figured it, out. Wow. I it was that wrong. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from Eric Vance. It was recorded in October 2015 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts as part of the Science Writers 2015 meeting. In 2001, I, um, in 2001, I found myself with a biology degree and, uh, and, and no idea uh, what it meant and, and what to do with it. So uh, I decided I needed to go out and, and discover uh, what biology is. Like, what does it mean? I had, I had a very um, romantic view of biology. So I, uh, I decided uh, I, would be go I would go to South Africa. And the reason I would go to South Africa is because I had seen The Power of One and it was a good movie. And, uh, and so I went to South Africa, and I basically knocked on uh, the door of a, 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 a lab in the University of Cape Town and said, uh, I, I'm, I'd like to be your slave for several months. And they said, okay. And uh, I ended up spending, <laughs> spending the next few months uh, counting polychaetes, uh, dissecting sharks, and uh, collecting seed heads uh, from um, uh, large uh, flowering trees. And, uh, and it was great, but the, the, one, the one experience that, that I remember most was the 10 days that I spent uh, catching porcupines in, a, in the north of the country. Uh, and apparently, occasionally, uh, the BBC and other documentaries, uh, other documentary makers will call up and ask uh, for biologists to help out uh, with various um, programs they're running. So I kind of got loaned out to this, um, to this uh, uh, show that was going to be aardvarks, and the animals that live in their burrows. It's very exciting, it's very exciting. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys actually know how, how uh, documentaries work, but you know, they don't just show up and, and start filming these like, amazing animals and following them around and like, going into these, these hard to get places. They actually send a team of biologists in first to, to lay the groundwork and to habituate the animals, which you'll learn about in a second. So, uh, so uh, what we ended up doing was we were, there, were, there were three biologists who had to go in and find the animals and tag them and, um, and prepare for the film crew that would come later. So uh, it ended up being me and uh, the sort of the, the head of the project whose name was Steve, I'll call him Steve, and he, uh, and he was sort of this very, very quiet guy who never said anything, but he could catch uh, a night jar with his bare hands, uh, which was really cool, and so he'd, he'd do that occasionally. Um, <laughs> And then there was Owen. I'll call him Owen. Um, 
So Owen, Owen was a, a recovering Satan worshiper who had decided that this would be a good way to come down off of heroin. Uh, and 10 days in, in, in the bush catching porcupines would, would be the solution for that. And he was full of these wonderful stories. He was a, a very uh, eccentric guy, uh, familiar with the back streets of, of, uh, of um, South Africa. And he would tell about the weekends that he would spend playing Dungeons and Dragons, waiting for the gun runners to pick up their shipment while high on speed. So basically they just played Dungeons and Dragons for like 72 hours at a, at a go. And, uh, and then he would sort of trail off and sort of look into the middle distance. Um, <laughs> He was a nice guy, and uh, so that's how we spent, we spent our days smoking cigarettes, and uh, Owen was out trying to catch fish in the, uh, in the, in the river with, a, with like a, a stick and, and, and like a hook. Um, and, uh, and then at night, we'd be in this giant truck barreling through what were basically footpaths, um, uh, uh, looking for, with these big lights, looking for porcupines and, uh, and trying to catch them when we found them. We learned that porcupines have two defense mechanisms. Uh, the first one is to bolt for the nearest hole. And it turns out that uh, porcupines, especially when you've been smoking cigarettes all day, uh, porcupines are really fast. <laughs> and so we spent a lot of time just like, like with our hands on our knees, sort of like desperately trying to catch our breath. <laughs> and it was like the third day when we bought gloves because <laughs> those can come in handy. Um, so that's the first uh, defense mechanism. The second de defense mechanism is basically to put their head against a tree, put their spines up and just say, fuck off. Uh, <laughs> give it your best shot. And, and these were the ones we wanted because, you know, we couldn't catch the other ones. So, <laughs> so finally, finally we found one. Oh, and as, as we're doing this, you know, we're, we're sort of looking for these things. And it's this, this, you know, Owen and I would spend a lot of time sort of, you know, we're on top of the truck, uh, Stephen's driving, and, uh, and we'd spend a lot of time sort of talking about and philosophy and, you know, and, and Owen, uh, I came to a revelation when I was talking to Owen one, one day uh, because I was talking to him, you know, I was kind of this obnoxious state in, in, our, in our youth where we, you know, we're like challenging like religion and like trying to push people a lot. And uh, I'd say, you know, how do you know there's a God? Oh, I should say Owen's a recovering uh, Satan worshiper. He'd become a born again Christian, <laughs> which actually isn't all that different. Um, <laughs> He still believed that Satan's claws were, were, as he said, like ripping into the flesh of his chest and you could feel it, but now it was a bad thing. And <laughs> before, it was a good thing. But he still talked about Satan a lot. And so I remember asking him one day, we're sitting on top of this truck and, you know, we got these lights and we're not finding any porcupines. And so I'm like, you know, how, so how do you know there's a God, you know? Like, I'm asking all these questions. He's like, well, I know there's a God because I know there's a, 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 a devil. I said, well, how do you know there's a devil? And he's like, well, I, I met his lieutenant and he named lieutenant. And it wasn't like one of the lower ones. It was like one of the big ones uh, <laughs> that, that was, you know, lieutenant to the, to the devil. And he's like, and we had a conversation one night and he tells me about this conversation that they had where uh, he was sitting on the, on, a, on the foot of his bed and like, and he was challenging him and it was just this epic battle of wills. And I, I asked him, were you high? And he said, well, yeah, I was on acid, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. <laughs> And I realized in that moment that, like, this was all that was keeping Owen together. Like, there's, you know, like, there was, you know, religion was it for him. And this is not someone you poke and try to find, like, holes in his theory. So, uh, <laughs> I was quiet after that. I didn't say anything else. <laughs> and finally, though, finally, after all this, we did, we did find, uh, we found a porcupine. And we caught him, and he was one of those who put his head against the thing. And that was, we had a, we had a, a syringe of ketamine, and, and so, uh... <laughs> We, we, we brought him uh, to, uh, back home, back to the, the, the house, and we, we, we cut him open, and we put a tracking device inside of him. And then we sewed him back up, and, uh, because no one, you don't want to see like a color around the animal on the film, right? Like no one wants to see that. So, uh, and then we released the animal into the wild. Um, and, uh, and then we waited to see if he survived. 
and uh, they named him uh, Uncle Eric, either in honor of me or mocking me. I was never sure of that. Um, but then we had to start the process of habituation. And habituation basically means uh, it's not taming. It's like a level down from taming. It means that the animal comes to understand that you are not there to kill it, and you're not going to give it any food. So it just ignores you after a while. And when they get to this, this point, then you can bring in a film crew, and you can bring in the sound people, and you can make noise around it, and, and, and the animal will just ignore you. So this is, this is a key thing. And the way you do this is you have to hang out with the animal, and you have to talk to it. Or you have to do something to make noise around it. Now, there's a couple different you know, ways to do this. You can sing to it. You can read a, uh, you know, read a book to it. Um, that felt weird. So... So I just talked to it, and I, you know, mostly I just told him about my relationship problems. <laughs> and it went a little like this. It was, and then she told me that she didn't want me to come because her friend was coming, but I didn't even want her friend to be there in the first place. So my mom, okay, so I have to go back a little bit on this. Okay, so my mom, several months beforehand, and, and all the while, this porcupine has his head against the tree, <laughs> looking down, saying, dear God, dear God. Just kill me now. <laughs> and I remember one night I was doing this and this poor animal was, he was sitting there waiting for me to tell this long drawn out story about how we couldn't share ce breakfast cereals. And, <laughs> and I, I thought I heard a, a storm coming so I, I walked up to the top of a little ridge about yay high and, and I looked down and I could see there was a, a storm sort of coming along the, the horizon. And I... I uh, I turned back and I said, okay, I got a couple hours, and I, you know, or an hour or so. And I turned back and I look and, and, and Uncle Eric is gone. Uh, he's taken off. So I turn on my tracking device and, uh, and uh, he's not on it. Like he's, it's not even pinging, which means it had a, a radius of about 100 yards, which means he had basically bolted 100 <laughs> yards in one direction and cleared that, that in about like a minute <laughs> to get away from this horrible human being. And I remember sitting there looking out over this, 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 this savanna uh, and watching the storm coming in and thinking about the Satan worshiper uh, heroin addicts and the porcupines and thinking, is this biology? <laughs> Thank you. That was Eric Vance. Eric is a native Bay Area writer replanted in Mexico as a non-native species. Before becoming a writer, he was at turns a biologist, a rock climbing guide, an environmental consultant, and an environmental educator. His work focuses on the human element of science, the people who do it, those who benefit from it, and those who do not. He's written for the New York Times, Nature, Scientific American, Harper's, National Geographic, and a number of other local and national outlets. He is currently working on his first book under contract with National Geographic Press about how the mind and body continually twist and shape our realities. Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, to Wade Roosh and everyone at Science Writers 2015 for being amazing partners and to porcupines for being the real meaning of biology. Thanks for listening. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and community safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.